ओके सो हेलो ओके सो वी विल गेट स्टार्टेड सो टुडे इज द रिव्यू लेक्चर द फॉर्मेट दैट आई एम अडॉप्टिंग इज द फर्स्ट ट्वेंटी मिनट्स आई एल टॉक अबाउट स्टैटिक गेम्स एंड देन uh and then i'll talk about refinement of equilibrium uh we'll talk about continuous kernel game and then i'll move on to dynamic games and the uh i'm going to spend majority of my uh my time on dynamic game because that's the most the the richest part of uh the game theory that we have studied so far so the static game setting is uh quite easy to understand you have so we started with preferences right from preferences we formed lottery from lottery we found compound lottery and over compound lotteries we had precedence relationship okay so we prefer one compound lottery over another compound lottery and so on and with this precedence relationship if it satisfies certain number of uh, i mean not certain number of actually if it satisfies four axioms then we we showed or rather i didn't really prove it but what we have is utility functions over preferences okay so the idea was we have preferences we form lottery which is uh, a probability distribution over preferences then we found compound lottery which is probability distribution over probability distribution over preferences okay so that's a lot of probability and then we formed uh, we said that well we have a precedence relationship over this compound lottery uh, so we prefer one compound lottery over some other compound lottery and then from this precedence relationship we can actually uh, using uh, separating hyperplane theorem or some other mathematical tool we can actually derive exact utility functions these are functions that map preferences to real line so utility functions over preferences to r okay and what we uh, what we understood is humans or rather decision makers want to maximize their utility okay and by saying that they would pick an action or they would prefer certain outcomes over other outcomes okay and utility function essentially captures this entire precedence relationship uh, over the over the preferences okay and so we with this thing in background we said that well now we have two agents and their action sets are a1 and a2 okay so a1 is the action set of player 1 a2 is the action set of player 2 and we define uh, utility functions ui which maps a1 cross a2 <coughs> to r okay and then if a1 and a2 are is if if they are finite sets then you can actually represent ui by matrices this is utility of player i and we can represent these utility functions by matrices if a1 and a2 are finite sets so this one will represent various values in a1 and this one will represent various values in a2 and this would be u1 and you can define a similar matrix for u2 okay and then von neumann said that well uh we can have a class of games that are zero sum where u1 plus u2 adds up to zero which means this matrix plus this matrix adds up to zero it becomes a zero matrix so that's zero sum game and uh what von neumann prove 
there exist p star and q star such that p star transpose oh i didn't really define zero sum but you know what i'm talking about so row player minimizes uh, cost row player is the minimizer and a is the cost matrix of the row player so p star transpose a q is less than equal to p star transpose a q star is less than equal to p transpose a q star okay and this is known as p star q star is known as saddle point equilibrium p star is in uh, probability distribution over a1 q star is in probability distribution over a2 that was the result of von neumann that is this is from 1928 and this is uh, coming from his book von, that was written by von neumann and morgan stern in 1944 okay so this is what he proved and then nash proved that well if these if these matrices don't sum to zero matrix then there exists p star and q star such that p star transpose a1 q star is less than equal to p transpose a q star and p star transpose a2 q star is less than equal to p star transpose a2 q okay this holds for all p this holds for all q and a1 a2 are a1 a2 are cost matrices of player 1 and player 2 respectively okay and this result was uh, actually this result is equivalent to brauer fixed point theorem okay this is equivalent to brauer fixed point theorem which means you can use brauer fixed point theorem to prove this and if you can prove this using some other result then you can prove brauer fixed point theorem knowing that a nash equilibrium exists okay so that was a static game and we also studied some numerical methods or rather we studied some optimization problems which if you can if you solve uh, you can actually compute nash equilibrium or saddle point equilibrium uh, computation of saddle point equilibrium was equivalent to a linear program so if uh, so equivalent to solving a linear program so if you want to find the saddle point equilibrium or the value of the game all you have to do is find solve a linear program very easy to solve okay you could also do fictitious play which you have implemented and you have seen that it actually converges to saddle point equilibrium uh, in the limit so that was the method for finding spe for nash equilibrium it's very hard to solve uh, it's considered one of the intractable problems in game theory to compute nash equilibrium but there are certain special classes of games for which nash equilibrium can be computed and we will study it two weeks later okay question no okay so then we wanted to we we moved on to talk about extensive form games where players move over time there is a sequence of moves okay and players observe other person's action and then based on that they make a decision over time and so there is extensive form game where where each player uh acting at time t uh gets some information so let's say player i's information at time t is i or let's say h 
it is a player i's info at time t okay so there are two classes of strategies that you can define for extensive form game one strategy is is a pure strategy where you pick gamma it which maps hit to the action of player i at time t so that's pure strategy and then you have an option of behavioral strategy where you have gamma it that maps hit to a probability distribution over the action set of player i at time t okay So in behavioral strategy, players randomize at time t, and their randomization is independent of the randomizations of the past. Whereas in pure strategy, there is no randomization whatsoever. So what you can do in extensive form game, if you have a very complicated information structure, you can actually just consider the set of pure strategies, and you can come up with a normal form of the game. Okay, so so the idea is you can You can define this huge game where you enumerate all pure strategies, all pure strategies of player one, and then all pure strategies of player two. Okay, and you form player one's payoff uh, matrix and then. You do the same thing for forming player two's payoff matrix. Okay, and based on what based on what uh, value they accrue or what payoff they accrue at the end of the leaf in the extensive form game, you populate this uh, these two matrices, and then what you say is well, we know that in matrix games pure strategy equilibrium is hard to find it may not exist so we will randomize all the pure strategies we will will consider the class of strategies which randomizes among all pure strategies okay in which case you are randomizing before you begin to play okay you randomize before you begin to play you pick which pure strategy you are going to act according to over the entire course of the game and then you act according to that pure strategy and same thing is done by player 2 and then they accrue some payoff based on the expected payoff of this of their actions whereas in behavioral strategy you say you do something different well you can't really form such a matrix for behavioral strategies okay because in behavioral strategies if the information structure is somewhat complicated then you are in trouble because uh because now you have to start computing the beliefs over which state you are on okay and that gets into a tricky situation so you can't really form a matrix game out of behavioral strategy all you can do is use pure strategies to form this matrix game and then compute a mixed strategy equilibrium so that's known as the normal form of the game but for a special class of game it turns out that you can always find an equilibrium in behavioral strategy uh, okay and what was that special class of game it was games with perfect recall so so this works for any game for any finite game okay this works any finite game any information structure this strategy this 
going from the extensive form to normal form and then computing the equilibrium, it works. Okay, there is no, there is no problem with that. But if you have any complicated, but, but then if you want to do behavioral strategy, it's a really messy set of equations that you need to solve, except in one condition when the game is of perfect recall. Okay, so game with perfect recall. In this game, it so turns out that each player remembers its past actions and each player remembers its past information. So, in some sense, you know exactly what the tree structure of this game looks like and you can do backward induction substitute the value using whatever value you have found for the subtree and then you can find the value of the higher level game and higher level game and that way you can compute the value of the entire game okay so it might look something like this okay so you find the value of this game find the value of this game this game this game okay and then you form another tree Okay, let's say V1, V2, V3, V4, you form another game of this type, okay, using backward induction. So you solve this lower level game first, then you solve this game and you solve this game, okay, and then replace it with V5 and V6 and then you solve this game and you get the solution to the original game okay and once you are doing once you are solving game of this form you can always find an equilibrium in behavioral strategy which means the players are going to choose an action dependent on certain probability distribution but their actions are not correlated with their actions here okay which is not the case with mixed when you are talking about mixed strategy okay so the actions here are uncorrelated with with actions here uh, as far as the randomizations are concerned. Those are independent randomizations. So that's really the, uh, the class of games where you can have equilibrium in behavioral strategy and it's very easy to compute because all you have to do is apply backward induction. <coughs> and then we studied a very important result for this class of games which is known as Kuhn's theorem. And Kuhn's theorem said if uh, gamma 1, gamma n, so this is a game of, with perfect recall and if gamma 1 to gamma n is, well let me write it in words because I, I don't remember how to put it in how can I write it rigorously? So let me put it in words first. Every mixed strategy has a finite has a has an equivalent representation in behavioral. strategies or in behavioral strategies yeah okay so if I give you a mixed strategy of a player no matter how other players are playing let them play according to a mixed strategy if I give you a mixed strategy you can always find a behavioral strategy that will give you the same expected payoff okay and this also allows you to prove that every game of perfect recall has an equilibrium in behavioral strategies okay it's because you can prove that every game with perfect recall you can form the matrix game in normal form you can find a mixed strategy equilibrium but you know that every mixed strategy has an equivalent behavioral strategy so you can use that behavioral strategy 
to get the equilibrium for all the players. So, so that was an important result. It was proved in 1952 or maybe 1953, somewhere around that time. Okay, so that was that was an important result for game with perfect recall. After having studied games with perfect recall, uh, we talked about any any question so far. Okay. So then we talked about refinements of Nash equilibrium. And I wanted to recall the, the game that we had formulated and that you have worked on in your assignment. So the game was, so A1 equals A2 equals 0, 1, 1, 1, 8, 8, 8. OK, some made up game. So there are three Nash equilibrium here. These are cost matrices. So this is a Nash equilibrium. So L, L, or top, M1, bottom, L, M2, R. And we know that TL is a Nash equilibrium. M1, M2 is also a Nash equilibrium. And B, R is also a Nash equilibrium. So we have games, non-zero sum games, where there are multiple Nash equilibrium. So in some way, you have to come up with an idea or come up with an approach so that you can say with certainty that you know what, I think the players are going to play according to this Nash equilibrium, and they won't play according to these two Nash equilibrium. And why do you say so? Well, the payoffs are bad. Okay, So this equilibrium gives both the players zero, so not payoffs, cost. This gives them both the players zero cost. This gives them cost equal to one, and this gives them cost equal to eight. So somehow, it doesn't seem plausible that if a player is playing that game, uh, they will play according to these two equilibrium. So you have to come up with some, some method, some idea. So we came up with uh, perfect equilibrium, which is also known as trembling hand. equilibrium in which you assume that, well, if I want to play according to this strategy M, if I want to come up with a refinement concept for Nash equilibrium, I'm going to assume that the other person will act according to the equilibrium plus some small probability that he might not play according to that equilibrium. OK, so if, if you started with P star and Q star, okay, <coughs> you perturb the other person's action. P star is still the best response of player 1 with respect to some 1 minus epsilon Q star plus epsilon some other probability Q, which is completely mixed, OK? Completely mixed strategy. So this is what you want to. Uh, this is what you want, and you want Q star also to satisfy this relationship: one minus epsilon p star plus epsilon p. Okay, p is some completely mixed strategy. So the idea is each person will play according to equilibrium with high probability. But they might deviate from the equilibrium with low probability. And if P star is still remains the best response and Q star still remains the best response uh, with respect to the trembling of the other player, then that becomes a perfect equilibrium. And there was problem with perfect equilibrium, which was if you add completely dominated rows and columns, uh, the set of perfect equilibrium changes. Okay, that's an undesirable property. So, so to to recall, the problem with perfect equilibrium was if you play this game, a one equals a two equals zero, one one one. 
then this is the perfect equilibrium. Now, if I add 0, 1, 8, 1, 1, 8, 8, 8, 8. So, I read this strictly dominated row and a strictly dominated, strictly dominated row and a strictly dominated column. And I see that this is perfect equilibrium and this is also perfect equilibrium. That's not good because we haven't really changed the fundamental nature of the game. All we have added is another action that is much more costly uh, in the new game. So that's not desirable. Not desirable. Okay. So then uh, Meyerson said, so this, this is perfect equilibrium, this is 1975. Okay, then Meyerson said 1978, that you know what, even though I have added, let's say I'm considering this game where I've added a strictly dominated row and strictly dominated column, if I assume that other player is going to make a mistake, this is a very costly mistake as compared to this mistake. And this is a costly mistake as compared to this mistake. So what I'm going to assume is that the trembling for, so the probability that he will, the, if I'm player one, I'm the row player, I'm assuming that the probability that he will pick this costly action is epsilon square. He will pick this action with probability epsilon. And he will pick this action, which is the least costly action with probability one minus epsilon minus epsilon square. So the costly actions gets overwhelmingly low probability as compared to the less costly actions. So that was the idea of Meyerson, and he proposed the idea of proper equilibrium, which says more costly actions get overwhelmingly low probability. Probability of mistake. Yeah. Uh, how do we arrange the, how to, like, the action? That yes. It's very obvious. Right. So, so if T was, so suppose you want to play, you want to say that TL is your equilibrium, okay? Then if you look at the, you have to fix the strategy of first player to T. Then you look at 0, 1, 8, so this is the costly action, so it gets epsilon square. This is second less costly, so it gets epsilon. And this one gets the rest of the weight. Now let's say you wanted to prove that M1, M2 is a proper equilibrium. You look at it. Uh, these two have the same, let's say, so M, so this one gets, this one gets one minus, this one gets epsilon because this is pretty much the same cost. So I'll give it a value epsilon. This I will give epsilon minus epsilon square and this one I'll give epsilon square. Okay, if I wanted to prove that M1 is, uh, M1, M2 is a proper equilibrium. Okay. But, I mean, like, they have the same cost. Why wouldn't just assign the same epsilon? So, when, then you are saying that M1L is an equilibrium. You have to pick which equilibrium, which of these three Nash equilibrium you want to prove is a proper equilibrium. Let's say you wanted to prove that this is a proper equilibrium. Okay. And, uh, you know, now I want to transform the matrix in such a manner that I retain BR as a Nash equilibrium. How do I transform it? Let's say 9, 10, 8. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's say this was your cost matrix and you wanted to prove that BR. I know that BR is not a proper equilibrium, but let's say for the time being that you want to prove that BR is a proper equilibrium. So you give this, you give this, so this is a costly action, so this gets epsilon square. This is the next costly action, so this gets epsilon. This gets the rest of the probability, so that's one minus epsilon minus epsilon square. 
okay so that's how you pick which action should get what probability yeah so for, for the original uh, matrix it is all of eight and if you want to prove that the r is a proper equilibrium mm -hmm. do, you, do you just assign the first and second column as epsilon and the last word one minus two epsilon no uh, what i'm saying is you have to pick which equilibrium you want to show as proper equilibrium Right. For the original matrix, which is all eight, is that epsilon, 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 epsilon? Yes, you can. You can take. Uh, yes. So in which case you have two actions that have the same cost, so then you just pick them to be epsilon and epsilon. Uh, I. It wouldn't matter whether you picked one as epsilon and other as epsilon square or not. Okay. It's the same as. Giving a probability of epsilon epsilon to every to both the actions. So in the original matrix, you don't even consider the uh, yeah. Equilibrium. Yeah, it was not a perfect equilibrium. Okay. So that was the idea of proper equilibrium. So costly actions gets overwhelming low probability of mistake, and then we talked about a uh, stable equilibrium that was defined in 1985. Stable equilibrium, which basically said that if A B is close to A tilde B tilde, then P star Q star is close to P tilde star Q tilde star. Okay. So if the games are close to each other, which means that the entries of A tilde are very close to entries of A, entries of B tilde are very close to entries of B, then the Nash equilibrium should not be very different. Okay, That's the idea of stable equilibrium. So in some sense, the equilibrium is stable with respect to perturbations in the cost function okay, or the cost matrix or payoff matrices. So those are the three major refinement concepts in uh, in the in uh, in game theory literature for static games and finite games. I have to admit that for continuous kernel games as well as for dynamic games, there are many other equilibrium concepts. Uh, which we will not, sorry, refinement concepts that we will not cover in this class. Uh, although, although if you are interested, I can point you to appropriate references where you can look up what the equilibrium, uh, what the equilibrium refinements are. In particular, sometimes it so happens that let's say you have a dynamic game, and you add uncertainty about which node you are standing at, and suddenly an equilibrium emerges. Uh, so, so if you knew what the states are, then you have a lot of equilibriums. But as soon as you allow some uncertainty in the state by adding some additive noise, then suddenly the set of equilibrium is shrinks to only one equilibrium. So you have a unique equilibrium as soon as you have some uncertainty about the state. Uh, but if you have no uncertainty about the state, then you have large number of equilibriums, overwhelmingly large number of equilibrium. Okay, and it's all there in uh, some of some of those examples are there in Bashar's book, so you should definitely uh, consider that. Consider reading that part uh, in 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 that book. Okay, it's very interesting to see that uh, some of that work was done by uh, Professor Bashar. Back in 1970s, around the same time when these ideas of perfect equilibrium and stable equilibrium were being proposed in the game theory literature. So that's really interesting um, that there was work happening in the control theory community at the same time when similar work was being uh, done in the, in the economics community. Okay, so any question on that? Okay.
for continuous kernel game, uh, we had A1 was Rm, A2 was Rn, and you had C1, which is a function of uh, A1 cross A2 to R, and same thing with C2. So how do you find an equilibrium in such a game? Well, if we assume that the cost functions are convex, strictly convex, then under certain reasonable assumptions, an equilibrium would exist, and that is given by Rosen's theorem. You can use Rosen's theorem, or you can come up with some other result that proves the same, uh, come up with some other uh, theorems that can prove the same result. Uh, but the idea is as follows. The idea is you define reaction curve, which is the same as best response. So you define R1, which is a function from A2 to A1, defined as follows. R1 of A2 is equal to argmin of C1, A1, A2. And this is A2 in capital A2. And same thing you do. For R2, you find the reaction curves, which maps A1 to A2, uh, which is the set of best responses with respect to A1's action. And then an equilibrium, so it looks something like this. So this is my A1, this is my A2. Okay. So these are the two reaction curves. Let's say this is R1 and this is R2. Whenever these reaction curves intersect, those are Nash equilibrium. So this is one Nash equilibrium and this is another Nash equilibrium. So if you have to do it numerically, how would you do it? Well, you look at this map R1 O R2 of A1 or R2 O R1 of A2, okay, you just have to find either this fixed point, either you have to solve this fixed point equation or you have to solve this fixed point equation. Okay, one of these two. Whichever one you solve, you get the solution to the others. So let's say you solve this and you got A1 star as the solution to this fixed point equation, then you take A2 star to be R2 of A1 star, okay? And that gives you the equilibrium. That gives you the equilibrium, okay? And same thing you can do for this uh, second player too. Now, the important thing to note here is, is that you could have a situation where this map is non-contracting, so it won't converge. If you iterate, it won't converge to the equilibrium, but this map is contracting, okay? So even though this iteration may not converge to equilibrium, you started with some A10, A1k plus 1 equals R10, R2, A1k. You started with this sort of iteration. It did not converge. Okay? You don't have to be unhappy because you can try this iteration and maybe it converges okay? because it might be a contraction map even though this is not a contraction map. So. So yes, so all you have to do if you want to compute an equilibrium in continuous kernel game is just run one of these iterations and hopefully you will converge one of these two and hopefully you will converge to the Nash equilibrium assuming one of those two maps are contractive or, or, or a contraction map. Okay, is that idea clear? So you proved it in the current assignment you have proved in one of the questions that sometimes these maps could be a contraction maps. Okay, especially if they are updating simultaneously or if they are updating in a sequential fashion. Yeah. In the assignment, there was, there was like a, we were updating the old uh, Kurno Jacobi. Same yeah. So we, could we have just like split it into like three different uh, contraction maps, and maybe if just one of them doesn't 
Okay, so my feeling is you won't be able to get, uh, so in two players it's easy to get such an expression. Let's say what happens in three players. So you have R2, which is a function of A1 and A3. <coughs> R1, which is a function of R2. No, I, I don't think I don't think we can get an expression of this type. So you will have to solve a simultaneous set of expressions that you've done in the assignment. Okay, for two players this would work. For three players, uh, you may not get an expression of this type. There is always so for three players. So if you have three players, you will always have two variables here. So you need to have two variables here in order to come up with a fixed point equation. How would you do that? Well, let me think about it. Maybe you can do that. I don't know. Just solve the whole equations together and then come up with like a single equation for uh, one of the variables like you want. No, you can't do that. Unless they are, well, no. No, I don't think you can do that. Okay, even though I'm making a sweeping statement, <laughs> I think it is true. Okay, I, 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 I will, s unless you can show me an example, I won't really believe that what you are saying might might work. You can't have an expression that looks something like a1 equals some complicated r1 or something or something of a1. It may not happen. You know what if what if instead of C1 being a function of A1, A2, and A3, if it is just a function of A1 and A2, and then C2 is just a function of A2 and A3, and C3 is just a function of A3 and A1, maybe in that case you can come up with an expression of this type. Yeah, I, I, I highly doubt that, but maybe you can do it for specific classes of problems. Okay, and in this case, if we can do this, then we don't have to Assume that we have a matrix equation to update Correct, correct. You don't have to. Instead of just relying on the maximum eigenvalue, right. you can work with this. Right. You can do that. You had a question? So, so I think you have uh, R1 inside R1, you have R2 and R3, right? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to see R1 would depend on A2 and A3. So this is my A1. Right, and I have to write A3 also in terms of R3 of R1, A1, A, and A2 is what? R2, A1, A3, and then A2 is R2, A1, A3. Now, if you look at this, this fixed point equation, then you might, I mean, if you can, <laughs> how would you prove that this is a contraction? I don't know, it's a nightmare, okay? But if you prove that these, this whole thing is a contraction, then you are fine, okay? Because you can write A1 and A3 as some function of, some function T of A1 and A3, okay? So it seems like you can eliminate one player from the equation and come up with a contraction map. Okay, so you can probably prove that this is a contraction. Everyone understands what these set of equations are. So all I want to do is get A1 and A3 only in terms of A1 and A3. Okay, maybe this might work, who knows. That's a good problem for final exam. Prove that this is a contraction. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about dynamic games now. Okay. Enough of static games. 
I wanted to spend 20 minutes on static games and time flied. Okay. So dynamic gaming is more important from electrical engineering point of view because most of the systems we study are dynamic systems. So the idea is you have a system that evolves according to a Markov fashion. Okay. So WT is the noise, U1T is the action of first player, U2T is action of second player, XT is the state of the system. And you have a cost function, so you have J of I, which depends on gamma 1 and gamma 2. Well, I haven't defined the information structure. Let me say that I, I of T or H, I of T history is x1, u11, u21, xt. So then you can define the expected cost of the player as expected value of the sum t equals 1 to capital T, cit of xt, u1t, and U2T. And this expectation depends on the distribution of WT, the distribution of X1, which is the initial state, and then also the distribution over U1T and U2T induced by these two strategies that players have, uh, have uh, players are planning to apply in this particular game. Okay? So in these games, uh, these are known as uh, Markov games. And you can compute the subgame perfect equilibrium in this game pretty easily by employing dynamic programming or backward induction, whatever you want to call it. So you define the value functions. So use dp to compute vit as a function of hit. Okay, so it depends on all the entire history. And that's one way of computing equilibrium. That would be subgame perfect. This would be subgame perfect equilibrium. Okay, and it will also satisfy a strong time consistency condition. So satisfy strong <coughs> time consistency. And the idea of time consistency is if, if I'm standing at this information state at time t, I will employ the strategy that I have started with. Okay, so if I define my gamma 1 star or gamma 2 star, and if I'm standing at HIT at time t, I'm going to employ the action which is equal to gamma i star t of HIT. So that's the time consistency. So there are cases where players don't act according to a time, cons according to a, a strategy that is not strongly time consistent. We haven't seen any example of it, but maybe I should give you as a homework uh, an example where there is no time consistency. So a future self deviates from the behavior because he, he or she feels that that's the best thing to do at that particular time step. So they pick the strategy at the beginning of the game, but then when they reach that information set, they say that, well, you know, I, I think this is a bad strategy for me. I should deviate. I should move away from this strategy. Okay, so, so that's not a strongly time consistent strategy. But, uh, uh, but in this case, for Markov game, if you use this uh, dynamic programming and you compute the value functions at every information state, and then you proceed backwards, the equilibrium behavior 
that you compute, which is gamma 1 star and gamma 2 star, that will satisfy strong time consistency and that will have, that will be subgame perfect equilibrium. So the idea is as follows, you define VI capital T of H I capital T as min over U1 T of expected value C i capital T uh, x t. This is this is H1 V1 U1 T U1 T and gamma 2 star capital T of H2 capital T given H1 H1 capital T okay and you do the same thing for player 2 and at time T V1 T H1 T is equal to min of U1 T expected value of C1 T plus V i T plus 1 as a function of V1 T plus 1 as a function of H1 T plus 1 given H1 T. Okay? So a lot of conditional expectations that you need to you need to compute in order to compute the value functions and and solve the problem. Okay, the argmin here would actually give you the uh, the behavioral strategy or if you have multiple arguments, then you have to randomize among them. You probably have to randomize among them. But if there is a unique UIT, which is minimizing this expression, then you can just take gamma 1t h1t as the argmin of u1t of this expectation or conditional expectation. Okay, that's the way, that's the method, general method to solve a Markov game problem. But you have complete history, okay? There's no uncertainty about what happened in the past. Then you could also say that, well, you know what? My cost only depends on xt. My cost only depends on xt. If the other player is using only xt to compute its strategy, then I can, I, I, I don't have to use any of this information. All I need is just xt. Okay, and that's Markov strategy. So in Markov strategy, gamma i t is just a function of x t, okay, just a function of x t. They, they, they don't have to care what happened in the past, okay. All they need to know is keep track of the current state, okay. They can throw away all the information that happened in the past. Why? Because the other player is also using only the current state to compute its <coughs> equilibrium action. So the cost just becomes a function of x t the strategy of the other player evaluated at xt, so my argument will just depend on xt. Okay, it won't depend on any other random variable. And that leads to Markov perfect equilibrium, which is a further refinement of subgame perfect equilibrium. Subgame requires the entire information, Markov would just require the current state. And then you could say that, well, you know, you're make, we are making a strong assumption. The assumption is both players are observing the state. Both players are observing the actions taken by the two players uh, over the entire past. And that doesn't seem like the right set of assumptions to make that can happen in a realistic scenario. If I'm the adversary, I wouldn't know many things about the system. And if I'm the system, if I'm the controller within the system, I wouldn't know many things about the adversarial uh, strengths or weaknesses or, or the kind of techniques the adversary is going to employ. 
So there has to be some amount of asymmetry in information. So that leads us to dynamic game of asymmetric information. And let me, uh, by the way, any question on this? Markov perfect equilibrium, you have a Markov game. There are two ways to compute equilibrium. E one is subgame perfect, the other one is Markov perfect. Okay, in Markov perfect, there's very little information that you have to, you have to carry. What was the subgame? Subgame is when you use the entire history to compute the value function. Okay, so if I, so this is this is subgame. This is what this is something you understand, right? Uh, at every point of time, each player uses its entire history to compute the action for what the action that it's going to take at that time. Why is it called subgame? Oh, subgame because uh, so what is a subgame? Subgame is when you truncate the game at time t and look at the game that's moving forward. Okay, so. At, at capital time t, you're only looking at the last stage of the game, okay? And then at, at any time t, you're looking at c1 of t and the future cost, future value. You ha but remember, what, what is the cost function? The cost goes all the way from time t equals one to capital T, okay? So I've kind of not, I'm not considering the cost that I'm accruing in the past. I'm only considering the future. So this is the future cost future cost, okay? So that's a sub game. Now if you think of it in the extensive form, okay, this is a sub game, this is a sub game, this is also a sub game, okay? And this is a sub game, okay? So that's called, uh, so, so from, so, in economics, they usually consider games of this type, and then they analyze individual subgames, and then they find what the value at individual subgames is. Okay, but in controls, we usually write it in a compact notation in this form. You have a state, you have a control action, blah blah blah. Okay, you write this whole description, which is two pages or three pages long. Okay, so. Uh, but the subgame essentially means you're just looking at, at every point of time, you're truncating what happened in the past with what hap what's going to happen in the future, and all you're considering is the problem of the future, not of the past, okay? So that's what a subgame means. The other thing that is important to note is that the reason why you can define subgame in this class of game is because each player observes xt perfectly. Okay, if there is any uncertainty about xt, if you look at it in the extensive form, what it means is the player doesn't know whether he's standing here or whether he's standing here. Okay, with very high probability he may be standing here, but with low probability he's standing here. Then defining a subgame becomes an issue. You can't really define a subgame. Okay. You just define, like say that we solve the subgame if yeah. we were perfectly in this Yes, so that's what we, that's what I was getting at in the next uh, topic, which was when we have this dynamic game of asymmetric information, then you can define this new game, which is in the belief space, and there the sub game is well defined. Okay. Yes. So let's see what happens in dynamic games with asymmetric information. So now I have asymmetric information. And let's say I have defined a common information which is H1T intersection of H2 of T, and then there is private information, which is HIT minus the common information.
<coughs> okay, and then I am going to assume that CT is a subset of CT plus 1. This is my assumption 1. CT is a subset of CT plus 1 and my assumption 2 is probability of XT P1T P2T given CT does not depend on depend on strategies. Okay, so I have some asymmetric information. You can also have observation equation y i of t equals h i. Well, h i is already used. Let's say g i of t x t v i of t. Okay, so some measurement noise and some measurement function. You have some sensors. They have there's a specific way by which that function maps the input and some measurement noise to an output. So and now you have asymmetric information. So you partition the information set into two parts. One component is known as common information. The other component is private information. And I'm going to assume that the common information always increases. So none of the players forget what they have already observed in some sense. Okay. And the second assumption is that if you look at this conditional probability, which is the distribution over state and the private information of the players given the common information, then it does not depend on the strategies which is gamma 1 and gamma 2. Okay. If this is your, if this is the game that you are considering, if the game satisfies these assumptions, then you can define a new game. over the belief space which is defined as okay so now i consider a new game where pi t is the state space okay and And this idea is very similar to what you see in POM DPs, okay? partially observable Markov decision problems if you have been exposed to that class of theory earlier. Okay, so, but because there are two agents now, in POM DP it's a study of uh, optimization for a single agent system okay, with, with uncertainty. But now because we have two agents, we have to be very careful because agents are non-cooperative and agents are strategic. They won't take any action uh, in a manner that doesn't improve their payoff. Okay? Uh, so there has to be some equilibrium. Now, the, let's get back to the original question that he asked. He asked that how can we define a subgame in a problem where you have asymmetric information? So, well, when you have asymmetric information, there is still some symmetry, okay? Because the common information gives you some amount of symmetry that you can exploit in this dynamic game setting. So you divide, divide the information into common and private. Then you compute the belief over everything that is unobservable. Okay, so XT, why do you need a belief on XT? Because XT appears in the cost. Why do you need the belief over P1T and P2T? Because agents make their decision based on P1T and P2T. Right, so somehow it, get, it appears here in U1T and U2T there is a dependence on P1T and P2T. So we need to monitor the belief given what both players already know. Okay? And then this becomes a state in this higher dimensional <coughs> game. And all you have to do is find a equilibrium in this higher dimensional game using the same backward induction algorithm. 
okay and it's all going to work out nicely if these two assumptions are satisfied so instead of writing h1t and h2t you have to replace it with pi t okay and you will see that everything works out very nicely okay you will be able to find the value functions at every stage and you are able to define the sub game because this pi t is common knowledge why is it common knowledge because both players know common information so they can compute pi t so both of them know which belief state they are standing at okay So that's the high level idea of how you can tackle a dynamic game with asymmetric information. Okay, by forming a belief over over the set of variables that affect the cost, you form a belief over it and then you know that because players know common information, the belief is known by both the players and because of that they can come up with a sub game and then they can use this backward induction algorithm to compute the value functions and the strategies okay the argument will become the strategy and then what you are saying is my gamma 1 of t at ct and p1 t is actually given by gamma 1 of t of pi t and p1 t okay so instead of using ct for making information for taking an action you are going to use pi t for taking an action okay so this is a very high level description of a of a general tool uh, and if you want i can point you to appropriate reference where you can find the the way to solve these class of problems okay now if these assumptions are not satisfied then you have to talk about sequential rationality and sequential equilibrium so so if these assumptions are not satisfied then then you have to talk about consistent belief which means pi t is consistent with gamma 1 gamma 1 and gamma 2 and then you have to talk about sequential rationality which says that gamma 1 t should be <coughs> rational given pi t and that becomes a very difficult problem to solve even though it has been solved for this case for a very special class of games uh, it has been characterized as recently as 2016 yeah 2016 so so it's not very it's it's fairly difficult to characterize an equilibrium where these assumptions fail because now you have to form consistent beliefs that is consistent with the strategy and then you have to define sequential rationality where strategies are rational which means it's profit maximization or utility maximization or cost uh, minimization problem given that you are standing at particular belief state pi t. So that was a lot of dynamic games. Okay. And now there is a special class of dynamic games where this T is actually infinity. Okay. So we now have a class of games which is known as infinite games. But then if you want to solve it in this setting, it's very difficult. So 
people have studied simpler settings for infinite games. And that is uh, what we studied in the previous two class. Oh, any question on this? No? OK, exam is going to be much easier than this. <laughs> OK, uh, no, no mathematical mumbo jumbo there. It's all simple and, you know, in the end of the day, both of us want to go home as early as possible on the exam day, so. No, because I haven't given any assignment so far in dynamic games, so it's not coming in the exam. Okay. So now we have this infinite game where we have none of this state space <coughs> stuff, or, or rather the state gets decided at the very beginning. And then we have repeated game. Okay. And in repeated game, the key result well, what is the setting? The setting is you have a finite game. Repeated infinite number of times. But with a twist, what is the twist? Players observe, observe each other's fast actions. Okay, if you don't observe past actions, it's not useful. Okay, but if you start observing each other's past actions, then you can start punishing. You also have the option of punishing the other person, and you also have the option of threatening the other person. Okay, purely because you can observe the action. If you cannot observe the action, there is no threat, there is no punishment. If you can observe the action, there is threat and there is punishment. If you don't do this, I'm going to take this bad action. Okay, so that's a threat. And, uh, and yeah, and that's also a punishment actually. Okay, uh, so, so that kind of behavior emerges only when you have a repeated game where actions are observed by other players. So, in, in this particular game, we had defined the minimax payoff, or minimax, uh, was it a payoff? Yeah, minimax value, which is defined as, or which is defined as, let's not do the value. Maximum cost, which is defined as C bar I is equal to max A minus I min A I C I A I A minus I. Okay, this is the maximum cost, and then I am going to define a set. V, which is the set of C in Rn, so there, there are n players, so let me assume n players, <coughs> C in Rn such that C is less than or equal to C bar I. So this is the maximum cost that the player would accru accrue if other players start punishing him. Okay, so they will act according to this arg max of A minus I. So C is less than or equal to O. C, C I is less than or equal to C bar I. So if you look at this uh, let's say this is my C bar one C un under bar one and this is my C under bar two and everything here is part of that set V. 
and then we had this folk theorem oh I did not define f so f is f is the convex hull of c1 a1 a minus 1 cn a n a minus n okay so you pick the entire vector of payoffs that each player will get at each action each set of actions and then you take the convex hull of all such vectors and the folk theorem says any cost in f intersection v is achievable okay so what would that look like let's say let's say these are my four cost values okay or convex so this this entire region defines the convex hull of uh, uh, convex hull of my entire uh, set of uh, possible cost okay this f so this is my set f and this is my set v what the folk theorem says is i pick a point here which is in the intersection of f and v and i can assure you that there is a strategy of every player that is in equilibrium and can achieve that particular payoff okay same thing here same thing here okay no matter where your payoff is it is achievable or not payoff actually in this case the cost so that was the folk theorem and then we talked about dynamic games so in the previous class we talked about repeated games where one player was informed of some random variable whereas the other player was not informed of that random variable so that was done in the previous class so hopefully all of you remember that case uh, and then there was uh, and then we also talked about vector payoff case and we talked about Blackwell's approachability theorem which is somewhat complicated so I won't introduce it in the class again but uh, but that's all we have done so far in the class okay and two weeks later we'll start talking about algorithmic game theory where we will talk about specific algorithms that have been devised to solve uh, or to find approximate Nash equilibrium in finite games okay so that's and then the next topic which probably will start somewhere around November first week of November will be all on mechanism design and auctions okay so any questions so far okay I don't have a specific uh, office hours for the final exam but because there are only 10 15 of you just send me an email and we'll find a time to meet okay what happened oh midterm exam there's no final exam here okay this is the best class you can take no final exam enjoy your holidays in Hawaii or Columbus Ha, ha, ha.